help me give uh, our speaker from San Diego, David Huey, a warm Sacramento welcome. If you feel, if people can't hear you, it definitely works, but it's not on. Okay, well, we'll try it without the microphone because I'm not afraid of shouting at people. And uh, I do have other fish, and I kind of almost started talking about it before when he had, you know, well, any new members? I'm a new member. <laughs> you know. And I do have other fish, but we're going to concentrate on the outdoor stuff right now. But afterwards, Mark and I, we love talking about fish. I mean, all the way up and all the way back, we'll be talking about fish. So let's get to the program. And I call it my pond experiment. Why is this not a how-to talk? I've been a member of societies for, you know, 30 years, and I've sat through a lot of them. And, well, they're all good, but, you know, it's such general information. You can get that information from books. So I decided, you know, they asked me to do a pond talk. And I said, but, ah, you know, I, I've seen them all. And I said, well, rather than give a how-to talk, I'll just tell you what I do. Um, every pond situation is different. Even identical ponds side by side, there, there's going to be differences. It's just strange. Um, this is a what might work keeping fish outside talk. And uh, I almost just titled it keeping fish outside because that's what I do. You know, when I started thinking about it, I said, well, maybe I should have a pond. And people said, well, are you going to keep koi? I was like, no. <laughs> koi are big. You know, you can't keep that many koi. Koi are expensive, and we'll touch on that later. Okay, and I, but you know, everybody, I think everybody likes looking at ponds, and uh, I think you'll be entertained by my experiments in lim limnology. Okay, ponds in 3D. Uh, we're gonna go through my background, which we kind of covered. Some of my ponds in June 2010 and now December. Um, a list of fauna, well, fish and plants that have survived outside, and a list of fish and plants that have not yet proven capable of surviving uh, San Diego County winters. Now, San Diego County, I'm out just uh, about 20 miles inland, which means that I get maybe three nights of freezing in the winter and uh, maybe seven days over the summer of uh, triple digits, not like here. Why do I have to do these experiments? It's because reference books only give recommended temperature ranges. Um, like, let's take this reference work. Uh, it's the Aquarium Atlas uh, bench. There are five of them. This is volume four, which is really hard to find. I actually ended up paying for the hardbound edition. I had to call my wife and say, hey, I found number four, can I buy it? <laughs> the other the other ones I have are uh, the softbound. They give you information on pH, hardness, and recommended temperatures, and also something a little weird, the first introduction into Germany. I thought that was kind of strange. I don't know if you can read this, but uh, you know, down there under the T there, it says 15 to 25 degrees and down there 24 to 28. Now, you know, pupfish are found mostly in North America. There's one species down there in South America and a couple on the islands in the Caribbean. But those pupfish that look kind of like this and like I'd say 99% of them look like that, they still retain the capability of surviving in a wide temperature range. I caught pupfish under ice, and I've also seen them in 104 degree water. So they have a pretty wide range. Uh, so I got this book, and about a year later, I was flipping through it and said, Oh, yeah, I've seen that pupfish, that uh, Fontanellis. Now, look at that. You know, psychologists say that the sweetest sound to anybody is their own name and that you're likely to recognize your own name first. Well, down here, where the first introduction, I don't know if you can see that. I saw this, here, Huey. I said, am I related to that guy? <laughs> and then I saw this, Dick Caring Rake Stoll. I said, I am that guy. <laughs> so in uh, 1989, my friend Kit sent the fish over to uh, the German Killifish Association. 
And this is my wife, my daughter, when she was just born. That was uh, 2003. Me, John Pitcairn, get stalled. This was at the uh, annual November show, which is the first weekend in November in San Diego. Every year. Okay, so my point of view. I have a naturalist interest in biology. I like everything. I chose fish as my obsession because, you know, I was like, oh, okay, I could be interested in all this stuff. I studied at UCSD. I worked in a retail tropical fish store for five years, which means that I have a lot of obsolete scientific names in my head. <laughs> oh, and I also did a revolving door policy. You know, I kept a lot of different kinds of fish. You know, you move through cichlids and anabantids and tetras and barbs and back to little, you know, live bears. I worked at a landscape construction company, landscape construction and design company, specializing in ponds, fountains, and water features. And I worked briefly for a swimming pool plumber. Um, and that taught me all the mistakes I made uh, doing plumbing before. So I, I have made tons of mistakes. But, you know, mistakes, there's only one big mistake, and that's not trying. You don't want to be forever regretting never having had a pond. Everybody should have a pond. Some people spend their time <coughs> spend their life wishing, and some of us go ahead and build a pond, doing our best to live a life with no egress. <laughs> yeah, that whole business in the front was just for this. I got that, I mean, those things are big when you come down. And, you know, he looked at me and I said, you're trying to eat my fish. And he just looked at me. I said, well, and I tried to scare him off, but with that foot long beak, you know, it's like, I don't know who's more scared. So you're likely, especially you guys, you live right next to a river, you know, on a lake. So you're going to see all these uh, avian predators. Osprey usually aren't a problem for small garden ponds. I've never had a problem. But just down the street from me, in that pond, uh, I saw that osprey catch a fish and go circle around and land up on that telephone pole. I ran home, grabbed my camera, took a picture of it. Didn't have a picture of uh, blue heron. My wife says she saw one kind of circling the pond, but I didn't get, get to see it. But I know they're going to be there looking at it. I mean, they can see them. I was on the internet and I looked at this and I said, oh, that's a good example. See how big that catfish is? You know, that's what, probably over a foot? You know, a koi that big, especially if it's a good koi, It'd be like a hundred or even thousands of dollars. And I had that, and a bird came and ate it, I'm pretty sure I'd be crying. <laughs> so that's why, that's one reason why I won't keep koi. Um, by the way, does everyone here know how to tell good koi from bad koi? Price tag. Taste. <laughs> well, good koi are the ones that the birds eat first. <laughs> now, you know, the things that make good koi, bright colors, sharp pattern, those are all the things that make them good targets for, for birds. I mean, I, I kind of like going to koi uh, keepers meetings because, you know, they're always <laughs> scoping out ways to prevent those birds from eating their koi. It's like, ah, thousands of dollars. <laughs> of course, I have to deal with this. This is a, a night heron. and. They're much smaller, but what they'll do is they can sit on the edge of a pond and just pick, them, pick off your fish as they come up and say, what's that? <coughs> so, I don't know that I've had them because you don't always see them. They, they do. They are active at night. But I know a neighbor that's not too far away from me had one in a tree. And she said, hey, you know that bird's been hanging around. And I said, yeah, that's a night heron. He's hanging around because you're standing here. As soon as you walk away, he's going to come down and eat your fish. And my wife got this picture of a kingfisher. I have yet to see one near my pond, but this is the one bird that I would let eat all my fish if it wanted to, just so I could watch it dive down. <laughs> when you have a pond, you're likely to have bird visitors. 
like raccoons, skunks, coyotes, rabbits, possums. I'm not sure about gophers. I mean, I don't know if they actually go to a pond to drink, but I have found ground gophers. Uh, neighborhood cats and dogs. That's how I got my dog. It appeared one day in my uh, backyard pond and it's like, well, who do you belong to? I guess me. Um, cats, they're not very good predators on most of the fish, but uh, they're really good at goldfish. You know, I, it wasn't a pond. I, I, I got this group of goldfish from somebody who was moving. You know, said, ah, i, I got to break down my pond. You want to catch goldfish? So I had a couple hundred and fifteen gallon tanks outside my house. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do with these? Well, it turned out I didn't have to worry because that night a cat just pulled them all out. I mean, you know, didn't eat them, just kept on scooping them out. Like, oh. Snakes, uh, where I live, uh, we have a couple different kinds of snakes. Luckily, no rattlesnakes. Um, and, I, you know, I hope I never see a rattlesnake because I'll have to kill it, and I don't want to. Yeah, but you saw a rattlesnake today. Yeah, but you know, that's on somebody else's property, so I don't <laughs> care. You know, as long as, it's, as long as it's not something I can step on, that's fine. I haven't had frogs or toads yet, I, and I don't know why not. You know, the uh, Pacific tree frogs should be around. And of all those things, the only thing that really causes me trouble is raccoons. They go in, they'll knock over stuff, they'll just stir stuff up. And, you know, if it's a shallow pond, they can actually catch a lot of fish. The only one I'm afraid of, really, are skunks. Because, well, they're skunks. You know, I'm thinking about fish and walking down and around in the dark. It's like, I hope I never see one. Yeah, you got one you can add to your list. Oh, yeah? Turkeys. Up here, we have turkeys, and if the pond isn't very deep, they'll walk through and they knock all the plants over and drag them all out onto the sidewalk and just stir everything up and make a heck of a mess. Yeah, it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, shooting them. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, what is a pond? You know, anything can hold water as far as I can see, you know. I was going to say outside, and then I thought, oh, you know what would be really cool? It would be cool to have an indoor pond. So maybe, yeah. Uh, Okay, the thing that uh, most resembles a normal pond is uh, that it's a horse trough. I think they're like twelve hundred bucks, but I got that. I got oh. one for three fifty. Woo! I got that one for two fifty. <laughs> 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 one of my uh, neighbor, uh, well, a longtime friend, Barbara Bean. She wasn't a neighbor. Uh, she had to break her pond. Now, as a matter of fact, she's the one who lost all the fish. Uh, Corridors Bar Bar Barbata, she said, oh. to the night heron. She said they just sat on the edge of that thing oh. and, um, and ate them. I'm like, really? Um, your guy's sore uh, flower. He kind of doors your goances. Um, I do keep a lot of uh, aquarium type plants outside. Uh, one thing about the Uruguay sword is. Uruguay is about as far south of the equator as San Diego is north of the equator. So you think that, well, you know, maybe stuff from there will survive. Of course, San Diego is about the same latitude as Arizona, and those two climates aren't too close. This is uh, a greenhouse I built for my wife when she was working in a nursery, and she liked to do cuttings and such. Um, I got the uh, tempered glass out of Craigslist, and uh, tempered glass is amazing stuff. It's heavy, it's, and you can't cut it. As a matter of fact, when I was trying to lift that second layer up mm -hmm. by myself, a uh, uh, three by four panel, I was like, wait a minute, I can't do this. So I took this panel down, and I was sitting there thinking, do I need help? And while I was standing there, I heard this pow, and there was a pile of glass bead pebbles at my feet. And I was like, what the heck? Uh, apparently, you can stress tempered glass, and not immediately, but a few moments or minutes later, it was spontaneously shattered. Mm -hmm. Happened to my shower door, too, when I was gone. I you know, came in, my daughter said, hey, our bathroom's full of glass. 
like, yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, what do I have outside in those ponds? Oh, yeah, the ponds are there because I love my wife. And she had this greenhouse. And you know, water is a great heat sink. And it helps keep the humidity up. That's what I told her. Um, <laughs> red tail gadaeus. They survive all year round out in San Diego. Rainbow cichlids. Uh, they don't. Feeder guppies. They don't. <coughs> you know, feeder guppies are so cheap. You figure they would, but they don't. And I used to have cutter cichlids. Um, it used to be Arcocentris cutter eye. Who knows what it is now? Um, I'm getting Christmas flower, and uh, not every flower is beautiful. It's like that's the ugliest little thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but the I'm getting Christmas is, is really nice, and there are native uh, I'm getting in California. Let's see. So in that pond, I have uh, white cloud mountain fish, four kinds of sword plants, and a blue iris. Um, well, with the flowers, you see the blue. Um, the echinodors are the Uruguay sword, Kleinobar sword, Melon sword, and oh, Argentiniensis. I got the Argentiniensis out of PetSmart, and it grew, and I sold a couple of them, and I tried to keep them over the winter, and I don't know, they didn't do well. But it's kind of weird because Argentina is actually farther south than. Uh, Uruguay, so I would have thought it would survive. Uh, you know, this cuts off the top of the slide, but I call that the octagon. It uh, was supposed to be a turtle pond. It started, let's see if I can go forward here. It started out as a uh, ringed tree planter, and there's a trunk in the middle of a California pepper tree. And when I moved in, there was a branch, a pretty thick, heavy branch that went over 15 feet across my electrical line. So very carefully, I pruned off the end, and then I pruned it this way, took it back down to the trunk. And about nine months later, there was a thin twig that went about 12 feet over, right at the electrical line. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to cut this. Sorry. I cut the pepper down. And then I started digging out around it to, you know, remove the stump. And I got about a foot and a half deep and I said, you know, this would be a neat pond. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a liner and I, I cut a, a hole, you know, in the center of the liner and dropped it over that, uh, that stump. And uh, at first I only had that first ring on it with uh, plastic, this right down here with plastic windows. And I put uh, five turtles in there that I got free because people are always willing to give you ready or slide of turtles. <laughs> and, uh, well, we have kids so that can't be too graphic. But uh, when I was working in the, in the fish store, I used to come in in the morning, we had turtles, and they'd be bathing on the log, sunbathing. And it was such a neat thing to look at. And I thought, that would be great to see in the morning. I'll look out, and I'll see those turtles in the pond sunbathing. Well, it's not so good when the dog cats had one on the lawn in front of you. Yeah, so I built this and I said, okay, I need to make it higher. So I went up another 12 inches. And, you know. Oh, by the way, this picture is from the top of my, uh, well, the roof of my garage, because I was trying to get a picture of those turtles. And as soon as my head would peek over the edge, you know, and it's like 12 feet away, the turtles jump into the water. So it looked at me and jumped in the water, but whenever my dog was around, uh, I guess it just, I don't know, mesmerized him or something. Because <laughs> my dog climbed over both of those and got one. So I got smart. I put a cargo net over the whole thing. And my dog bit through the cargo net and got one. And I'm like, that's impossible. But, you know, I had a wet dog and a part of a turtle. On the, you know, it's like that. So, you know, in about five years when my dogs are... 15 or 16 and too frail to climb up over there, I'll maybe stick turtles back in there. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, still I, have, I have Blue Iris and Spike Rush, courtesy of San Diego Water Gardens Club, Bacopa and Bladderwort. Um, and the reason I put that in is because, you know, 
Not that I won't care so much about nurseries, but you know, you go in there and you look at pond plants and they're really expensive. I mean, they can sell water hyacinths to people for like three bucks each. I mean, people are dying for me to take water hyacinths. It's like, ah, how come this? So if you're looking for cheap pond plants, you know, usually if you go to a pond club, everybody there is trying to get rid of all the stuff that they have. Um, Bladderwort's an interesting little plant. It, you know, it's an aquatic, carnivorous plant. It's got little tiny bladders that will eat small, uh, very small uh, crustaceans or uh, single cell animals. It's an interesting plant, but it's a weed. Well, that's how all the pond plants really are. Um, I do have water lilies. I, I don't have a picture of all the flowers because, as you can guess by now, I'm really cheap. And I just wait for cheap ones. It's like, hey! You know, but that, I have that Sue because I, I think it's fascinating the way they start off one color and they change and lighten up into a yellowish. I got my wife that hippo for her Mother's Day birthday. I mean, you got that for the water hyacinth. Yeah, you know, I, I thought about doing something. But anyway, those, um, those fiberglass tubs and the ones in the uh, the ones in the uh, greenhouse, I got those from a, a long time aquarist and uh, he said he got them from some highway project and they were using these fiberglass forms for something. I don't know what, but they hold water, about 90 gallons, They're like uh, four by four by a foot deep. So my wife wanted some, she's interested in California native plants, so she wanted to screen our aquatic area for the plants. So because I love my wife, I said, we'll put ponds there. <laughs> That's okay. If you uh, have ponds, you will... Oh, that's a lobelia. A nice, pretty flower. And I, I keep on looking at that, wondering how come I didn't pick it up before I took the picture. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's a good thing, because, you know, if you lie them down, they'll actually send roots out of the nodes, and then the uh, stalks will grow up from the nodes, and you'll have, uh, you can propagate it that way. <coughs> That must be why I did that. Yeah. Uh, there are native marcelia, uh, four-leaf clover plant, um, and you'll likely see honeybees drinking uh, in your uh, in your pond. There, they're you know, luckily they're on uh, on dirt and sipping at the at the moisture. They'll just land on algae or anything else floating in the pond and then try and and drink. And I don't know if they're just uh, clumsy or what, but they always fall in. Oh, yeah, anything can be a pond. I call this my mini dragonfly pond. Uh, I was pulling a dragonfly larva out of the out of my pond and said, you know, what's really cool is if you get a dragonfly nymph, and that's what they look like, they'll live in the pond, in the water, until they're ready to change into dragonfly, crawl out, grab a plant, and the dragonfly will emerge from that, that husk. And it's really cool to watch the uh, wings expand as they pump blood into them and fluid. So that's why I made that little mini pond so that I could catch the dragonfly coming out. Oh, invertebrate visitors. Uh, dragonflies, damselflies. You know, some people say they can't tell the difference. I, I find that hard to believe. You need to be out there in the pond more because you can see right. You can just see by the way they fly. But when they land, dragonflies have their wings outstretched. Damselflies can fold their um, wings behind their back. You know, kind of like the difference between butterflies and moths. Uh, midges. Midges are little flying things. They might be gnats. They might be anything. I don't know. I'm not an entomologist. Uh, water striders. The first time I saw water striders in my pond, I was so happy because it. It just seemed like, ah, oh, Mother Nature must love this pond because, you know, every time I go out to the mountains and look in the stream, there are water tigers. Water tigers are beetle larvae. I don't see those much in my pond, and I'm not sure why. I see them a lot in the vernal pools in San Diego. Uh, maybe the fish eat them, I don't know. Then you got a bunch of little scientific, creepy crawly things. I don't know if you are phased by the names of copepods, ostracods. Planaria, 
I was excited to see planaria because, you know, they do scientific experiments. You can cut them and they regenerate and all. Uh, bryozoans, those are like a freshwater equivalent of uh, coral. They send a colony out and they, you know, have the little, uh, little tentacles coming out there. Leeches, um, I know you probably aren't excited about it, but I am. <laughs> it's like, first time I saw a leech in my pond, I was like, where did you come from? Uh, Gamorous, that's a good fish food. And it's really kind of weird because most of my fish won't eat adult Gamorous, but you stick fish in with adult Gamorous and uh, you never see more. And then the adult Gamorous die. Uh, Gaphnia. That's a little unusual because I have fish in all my ponds, so uh, normally they'll knock the daffia down. But occasionally things happen and I, <coughs> I have daphne in my ponds. Hydra, because those are great predators of small life. Parame oh, some microscopic stuff like paramecium, eglena, diatoms. And then I said, and mosquitoes. If you don't have fish in your water, you're likely to have, you're almost certain to have mosquitoes. And uh, as a matter of fact, I got a visit from the uh, mosquito abatement people because they had you know, done a flyover with all the photographs and they said, yeah, we were kind of curious what's going on here. Uh, earthworms. In one of my ponds, I've got this uh, planter uh, pot full of dirt and I'm pulling earthworms out of it, and I'd like to know if they're just the regular earthworms or some special aquatic earthworms. One of these days I'll find out. Freshwater sponges, and there's a lot more other things, but I ran out of room there. Are the Camaras and Daphne, uh, do they just show up? Oh. Or did you import them with a plant? Well, the thing is, I throw Daphne in everything. Okay. You know, before, when I first set up a, a, a pond and fill it with water, I throw Daphne in just because, well, you know, there's no fish in there, and if they, if they survive, I'll be happy. And I actually tried to set up Daphne a pond, but for some reason, when the Daphne are doing well, I'm catching Daphne out, I'm really happy, and then I get this bag full of fish that need some place to go, and, you know, I'll move them in a week, maybe, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe I won't, and then the Daphne will disappear. Now, this is kind of messy, and I put this in for Rich because, you know, he felt guilty about how messy his stuff was. Um, I, had the, I had these 26 gallon tanks, metal frame that, you know, they didn't have uh, lids, they, the uh, lights had rusted out, so I set these up in back there. They didn't do well there. I don't know if it's because they're in constant shade, or if they're just too small, or if the uh, size of them, is, you know, the uh, if there's too much glass area, so they get too cold and fluctuate, the temperature fluctuates too much. I don't know, but I was never happy. And then uh, this summer, I got this uh, 240 gallon tank that uh, was cracked. You know, people are willing to give me all their cracked tanks. It's amazing, <laughs> and I'm willing to take them. So. I got this in the summer, but by the time I had sealed the crack, I just uh, got a big pane of glass, had a thin smear of silicone rubber across the entire pane of glass, and slapped it along the back. Uh, by the time I got it sealed, it was September, and I don't like to put things outside when it's getting colder. Even those things that will survive normally, you know, they need a chance to get accustomed to the surrounding. So, Come March or April, I might put in something that I know is cold hardy, but uh, come May, I'll stick anything out there because it will be warm. Um, if you look behind, the, let's see, on that side over there, that's uh, some 10 gallon tanks with a 29 on top, and that's not really set up there. It may look like it, but I had to move that out of my fish room because I had this great idea. Well, I found these cheap. 30 gallon tank, so I have this rack that I built, uh, tw 12 30 gallon tanks that over the winter I'm going to bring in the fish that can't handle the cold and put them in those tanks. And uh, hopefully I'll keep the tanks empty when they go back outside, but 
we'll see how that looks. Okay, this is a view from the back window of my house. It's a really nice uh, view. But the real important thing is that right here, it, it's a very, it's hard to tell in the picture, but it's a very steep slope. And here's an avocado, a grapefruit, and a uh, orange tree. And you can kind of almost see ponds down there. But what's nice is you can't see you that much, see? <laughs> Why my wife shudders when she sees me sees me reading the free category on Craigslist. That's why. <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of stuff. I actually got the, this black tub. Let's see. That one up there from a friend who was moving. Um, and it, you, I don't know what it was. It's some, maybe a septic tank. I don't know. But they cut the top off of it and they were using it for goldfish. So that's what I'm using it for. I've got a line of uh, bathtubs down there. <laughs> and uh, I quit when I got six because they like, well, you know, they're not really good. Oh, I've got two more right here. Got the kitty pool, which are lousy as ponds. They degrade too fast. They don't hold enough water. They're too shallow. Everything walks through them. I've got some preformed ponds here. Um, I, I'm sure you've seen them for sale. Um, I wasn't happy with those either. Robert made tub, 150 gallons. Those are good. Um, a couple, of what used to be horse cross, I guess, right there. Oh, let's go on. Let's see. Oh. Oh, and then I got that 18 foot uh, above ground pool. <laughs> and it started out at four feet, but I figured, nah, I'm going to cut that thing down. So I cut the uh, metal in half and then I set it up. And of course, if you get it off of Craigslist, then it, uh, it leaks. If they tell you it, it's okay, it has a slow leak. If they tell you it has a slow leak, it's got it. Yeah, it empties. In fact, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to empty anything out by poking a pin in it and letting it drip. I mean, it takes forever to, to get a gallon out, but a pond will go down to dry overnight. It's amazing. Uh, I keep canna around there because I thought, well, you know, I have a constant source of water. I'll just put the, the water in there. Incidentally, that date is wrong. My camera, you know, the battery ran dead. Okay, so I have to have a couple more of these fiberglass tubs. And I had the green Texas cichlid, which used to be Heresy's carpentis, rosy minnows that, you know, they sell them for feeders, and uh, Amica splendens, it's a butterfly gadea. Um, Amica splendens won't survive outside, but they are really good algae eaters. Uh, the rosy minnows, you know, they sell them everywhere for, you know, 10 for a buck or something like that. And uh, I looked them up, and apparently they breed like cichlids. And one of these days, I want to set them up and actually uh, watch that happen, because I can't imagine a minnow guarding eggs. Uh, green Texas cichlids. Now, <coughs> there are two fish. There's a real Texas cichlid, cyanogatatum. And, uh, you know, Texas, it ought to survive. These made it through the winter and died in March. <laughs> so I'm thinking that if I had them in either a deeper pond or if I could get them to feed during the winter, they might actually survive because it doesn't make any sense that they would die when the weather start, when water starts warming up. Uh, this is Marcelia Canada. I started taking random pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's an awful picture of the Australian thing, yeah. Because um, it's, it's a nice plant. Uh, it's got beautiful yellow flowers. Okay, this is one of the bathtubs with, uh, looks like a toilet tank in the back. Um, the reason that toilet tank is in there is because I had it. I was like, well, maybe I'll use it someday. Maybe I could use it as a planner. I don't know. That's how things work around my place. Um, I got Florida flagfish, like on the bolso table, and the least killifish, Pederandria formosa. Both of those are Florida fish. Both of those are North American fish. Okay. Um, I tried keeping the uh, killifish uh, Australia, uh, excuse me, Australia out in the pond, but even though people said they do well in hard water, if you look at the definition of hard water, it starts at the 
around 50 or 60 parts per million. I live in San Diego. The, the least re the parts per million reading I got out of my uh, tap was 380. Mm. You know, and, and it used to be 660. So, you know, like, well, one of these days I'm going to try it with distilled water out in the pond. Oh, got changed it over to a hard during red points, uh, half peaks, and uh, hey, do we have any federal wildlife people here? <laughs> <laughs> I had this unidentified pup fish in there. I got it from Arizona. Um, oh, and there's a killie, a uh, Tanganyikan killie, uh, Lamprichthys, that I grew out in during the hottest part of summer. Because in that part of summer, everything will survive. But uh, Lamprichthys, you know, Tanganyika is about 80 degrees, and you know they'll die off very soon. So I just got some fry off uh, the auction, raised them up, and put them back on the auction. Oh, that artichoke plant there? That's why that the pond behind it, the liner pond behind it, is there. Uh, I got these horse. I'm uh, picking up horse manure as uh, 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 garden fertilizer for a vegetable garden, and I found those. Uh, those troughs and they rusted out bottoms. So I said, I'm going to drop a liner in there and make two ponds out of them. Well, my wife brought home these artichoke plants and said, Hey, you got anything we could plant these in so the gophers won't get them? So what I did was I put a uh, hardware cloth on the bottom and then filled them full of uh, compost and, you know, potting soil and grew the artichoke plants there. And I said, Yeah, but, you know, I got this nice, these matching things that are lined up there. I said, hey, I got this liner that I bought out of Harbor Freight about, you know, six years ago. I could set up a, a, a liner pond. So they, that, I said, I could use the uh, planks that I got out of a greenhouse and put them there, 12 by 8, and uh, drop a liner in it, and that worked out pretty good. That <clears throat> pond doesn't have a real frame. All it has is two planks uh, standing on edge on each other. And then I have ponds on the outside that hold the planks from falling over. <laughs> okay, ah, yes. Um, I did this, it's a crude drawing, but you see, if you're ever going to do a liner pond, I, somebody will, will do a liner pond, they'll build a box and say, okay, I've got this. Uh, 8 by 12 foot box. So if I get a liner that's 10 by 14, I could be a, a foot deep and I know that the liner will fit. Well, the problem is, let's see, I like, didn't draw that in uh, hard enough, but up at the top, in that, well, in this bottom corner right there, if you look at it, the liner, the point of the liner that will be dropped down there will, um, will mean that you have a little bit of extra liner material in the corner. And you would think that'd be a good thing. <laughs> but what that extra material does is it allows the liner to come out and down. And you'll lose a couple of inches of height, water height. And uh, even half an inch down below uh, the edge looks awful in a pond. You want to fill it all the way up. So what I did when I was doing my line of pond, I said, hey, this is not working. I said, oh, I'll just toss dirt or sand into the corners. I lift that corner up uh, no more than about four inches, and I got a nice, clean liner edge. Uh, liner pond, you can use PVC, EDPM, the cheap kiddie pools. And I bought them out of uh, probably Walgreens when they are clearing them out. Uh, even plastic drop cloths. Now you say, plastic drop cloths, you know, you like out of 99 cents? Yeah, they're not going to last very long, you could do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you end up in an emergency, sometimes you can do stuff like that. The PVC should be 20 mils thick. The ones I got from Harbor Freight were seven, which uh, is not, a, not thick enough. It just degraded way too fast. Uh, on one edge of the uh, line of pond, I buried this 55-gallon uh, barrel, and I stuck uh, water hyacinths and black mollies in it. 
uh, black mollies, you know, a buck each. And usually, if a fish costs a buck, they're pretty hardy. <laughs> now this is a, you know, in the middle I got this. I gotta tell you the story of this one. So we moved into the house and it had a brand new dishwasher. And after a year, after the, the uh, warranty expired, it started leaking out of the bottom. And I used to work in a swimming pool plumber and, you know, swimming pool pumps. So I, you know, opened it up and looked at the, took the motor off and I said, ah, oh, it's the shaft seal. You know, the shaft seal is like an inch and a half plastic cylinder. So I called up the company and said, hey, I just need the uh, shaft seal for this model. How much is it? $168. And I said, I don't need the pump, I have motor, I just need this, this little plastic part. And she said, $168. And I said, oh, thank you. And I hung up. I said, you know, honey, we might as well just buy a new wash, wash, uh, dishwasher because if this fails again in a year, I'm, I'm going to be really ticked off. It's a bad design. So I threw the, the pump away because it was all rusted out. And uh, the dishwasher, you know, it's hard to handle because the door is heavy. So I took the door off and threw it away. And then I was carrying this plastic liner out and I said, you know, except for that big round hole, this thing would hold water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had a piece of uh, half inch glass and I got some epoxy I've seen on TV from my uh, mother-in-law for Christmas, because she knows me. And I said, oh, I'll try using that epoxy. And it worked mostly. I didn't do a very great job, so I did have to use silicone on the, uh, to really seal it, but that was my fault, not the epoxy's fault. Uh, oh, yeah, since we're on the subject of pumps and motors, uh, that's a swimming pool pump, you know, and, well, I'm going to show you I hope I can show you on my little drawing here. Like, when you look at a swimming pool pump, you see that there's a big thing out in front, and that's the leaf trap. And then the pump is actually that little skinny thing right there, and there's an electric motor. And the reason I want to make this clear is because we get into this habit of a sloppy language, and you're talking about things, and it, it can be confusing. Now, that little skinny thing that is a pump has an impeller in it, which looks like a propeller, and it spins around at 300, about 3,300 RPM. No matter what the horsepower is, that pump will spin at that rate because they're all designed to spin at that rate. So at the water level, they all throw about the same volume of water. So, you know, a one horsepower pump will pump the same as a two horsepower pump. The difference is when you have a difference in height. Like if you're trying to pump water up 16 feet, a one horsepower pump will pump an adequate amount of water, but a two horsepower pump will throw a lot more. Uh, and a two horsepower pump probably will, will go up to like 20 some odd feet if you ever had to go that high. In swimming pools, what they use for filters are those either big coconuts or diatomaceous earth filters, and they're forcing water through. So there's a tremendous amount of back pressure that they have to overcome. So that's why they're using the higher horsepower pumps. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I have the simple formula of volts times amps equals watts. You can look that up on the uh, internet if you ever have, need to, but it's an easy way to figure out how much energy you're using. Uh, by definition, and this is hey, crazy, one horsepower equals 745 watts. It's like, oh, oh, that's right. That's how they decided what things were going to uh, be equal to. And uh, 24 days times, uh, 24 hours times 365 days is uh, about 8,760. I don't know what the electrical rate up here is, but you know, you'll be able to figure that out. Um, now, one of the things about swimming pool pumps is they have a shaft seal, you know, to keep the water from leaking out. But, you know, it has to seal a moving object. So that's a very difficult thing. And it uses a lot of energy fighting the seal. 
So if you're using something like an impeller, a magnetic impeller, that doesn't need to have a shaft seal, it will actually uh, be more efficient than one of the swimming pool pumps. It, the problem is that a magnetic impeller will slip and slide if you have to force water up beyond, say, eight feet. You know, it just won't be able to do the job. But if you're not, if you're only trying to move water up four feet, the magnetic impeller is the way to go. Um, when I worked for uh, Aquatic Environments, the uh, landscape company, we got called in to kind of uh, consult on something for the uh, uh, pond maintenance company, Aquatic Life Services. And there was this guy who lived in Fairbanks Ranch in San Diego, a very rich neighborhood. This is back in the 80s. And to buy a lot there was a, a million dollars hmm. an acre. And you had to buy the lot and put a million dollar house on the lot. And it had to be approved by their architectural thing uh, committee. So this guy was really rich, and he built himself this nice house, Chateau de Wolf. And in front, he had um, a goldfish pond. And they said, you know, it's just not pumping. So what they did, we looked at the pump room, and they had the intake tee off into these two, two horsepower pumps and then join back together here. <laughs> and I was like, well, the reason you're not getting anything is because no matter how well you try and time flipping both on, they're just going to circle around like this, or they're going to fight each other, and you're just getting a trickle. It was easy to diagnose because if you just turned one on <coughs> instead of a trickle, you got a little bit more, like, you know, a ten-time trickle. And I said, well, you know, the problem is, it doesn't matter. You're still circulating water around and around. You know, your best bet is just to cut it, cap it. So he was spending a lot of money on that. In back, he had a pond big enough for a bass boat. And the way I know that is, he had a bass boat. <laughs> and they would feed, you know, like a thousand feeders into that pond. And they said, you should see this. This looks great. And they said, it's got a 100-foot waterfall. I'm not sure if the waterfall was 100 foot or not, but it was very tall. And he had a couple, three horsepower, maybe five horsepower pumps on it. And it would trickle down. I mean, it would, it would pump all the way up and then uh, come down in a cascade. And I said, this is kind of stupid. You know, if he had just had two pumps and taken this one and only pumped to that level, and then had this uh, small one horsepower pump pump to the next level, he could have cut the electrical cost tremendously and had the same visual presentation because you're not going to know which water goes where. His house sitter, and I have to say at a Fairbanks Ranch, all the times I was there, I never saw anybody who lived there, only gardeners and maids <laughs> and us, you know. The guy who was house sitting for him showed me his electrical bill. It was $10,000 a month. Oh. That's like 1980s. Wow. Um, in that liner pond, uh, the first thing I, I kept in there was uh, Ruli Sparks. We had a grow out contest down in San Diego. Every year, what we do is we agree on some small fish or uh, some fry to raise. And this time it was a Ruli Sparks. Um, so I had a bunch of extra really spark growing up. Um, we bring them back for the November show, and there's a contest on it. Anyway, so I had these really sparks, and they, you know, they would spawn out there, and that's nice. But the really weird part is I dropped this uh, one-gallon glass goldfish bowl in there, and I'm not even sure why it was in there. I think I had it, and it's like, oh, I don't want to kick it. I'll put it in the pond. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll remember it and get it out some other time. But I would walk down there in the morning and watch, and sometimes nine of these four inch Ruli sparks would come swimming over, and all nine of them would head into that and swim around and around and around for about 10 seconds and swim out. And then they'd come back and do it again. And that's what I really love about the ponds. I see things that I don't. I, I can't imagine ever seeing any other way. And it must, 
there must be an explanation, and someday I, maybe I'll find it. But <laughs> it was just interesting. Incidentally, another thing, I'd like, I'd like it if everybody would kind of have a tank too big for their fish, because you can't see natural behavior in a fish unless they can get away from each other. Uh, I mean, if you see fish in a tank at uh, schooling, how can you tell? They can't get away from each other. But if you see it in a pond, it's like, oh yeah, they like being with each other. Uh, in one of the bathtubs, I had guppies over the summer with Miramesa mud. The reason I put Miramesa mud in there is because I have a friend who said that it's high in iron and that's good for the plant. The other reason is there uh, are fairy shrimp uh, that live up in Mira Mesa. And well, they probably, you know, well, let's just say fairy shrimp eggs are hatching in there sometimes. Uh, I took the guppies out to do that. <coughs> the preformed ponds, the kidney shaped things that, um, you know, I, I got them free because they, they leak. But I put one of those kidneys. <laughs> Kitty line was underneath, and you know, it didn't matter if it leaked, it just uh, got there in the liner. Uh, but the problem with those is that they're just the right shape for raccoons to eat everything in it. You know? But uh, I have a four foot level because I wanted to remind you all that visually, the most important thing on a pond is that it be level. Because if you go out there and you look down and you see it, you see the water level doing this, it, it is so upsetting. I have no idea why, but it, it so you, you know, whenever you do a pond, really, really, really strive to get it level. Uh, those kidney shaped ponds are, have this deep center, and I cheated because, you know, when I was with the swimming pool plumber, I dug a lot of ditches. It's hard work. So what I did is I dug just the center out and then piled mulch in around the edges. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I had uh, Hapacomus burtoni, an African cichlid in there. And uh, like I said, I'm not sure if the egret or the raccoon got them, but you know, they never showed up after <coughs> the second day. Oh, there are a lot of different color irises. See, mm -hmm. no iris. <laughs> irises are funny because, you know, they only bloom for two weeks out of a year. You know, but they're kind of cool. And I like them, but it still it still cracks me up that they have colors. You know. um, I got one from PetSmart, the Louisiana Gamecock, uh, and I looked at it and I said, "They're selling this? It's like a two-inch skinny little thing." I'm like, well, I bought it. You know? That's why I kind of <laughs> like to get my iris out of uh, from other aquarists because you didn't even get a plant. Uh, there's a dwarf horsetail, uh, Equisetum scrupoides, which is supposed to, well, I just like it. I just think horsetails belong around a pond. Uh, pennywort, you'll find those in the, in the aquariums, but, you know, they're what they call a marginal or a bog plant. Uh, oh, spiral juncus, and my, uh, I should have wanted that, no, much more. Uh, <laughs> I, I just like those little spiral. I had one that really looked like a little spring. Uh, in that Rubbermaid uh, tub that the egret was sitting on, I had uh, rosy barbs, and they, let's see, I think I'm probably on like the fifth generation. Rosy barbs have done really nicely for me. Um, in that black tub, it's, I think, probably around 700 gallons. I have paradise fish and shabung goldfish. They probably shouldn't be in there together, but they are. And they, they do uh, well. I have a lot of floating containers around there. That's because uh, uh, they breed in there. And I would take the eggs out and stuff them in those small containers and let the eggs hatch out. And I had great plans of raising the babies and selling them and being a millionaire. Uh, that doesn't happen too much. Uh, and what's really cool is that the the paradise fish, you know, they build bubble nests under the uh, lily pads. The goldfish lay eggs in the water hyacinth roots. Um, watercress, that's edible. Mm -hmm. Let's see, nasturtium, I'll fish it out. Uh, yeah, I got this rotella from a, uh, uh, an auction at an aquarium meeting, but I'm not sure what species it is. It did really well out of the water. 
you can make this into a font. One thing about um, about a man-made th uh, things that we use for for people that hold water, they're not really good fonts because you know even this huge thing. If you think about it, they only use one gallon of flush or 1.7 something like that. That's not enough water. But make sure it's level. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I don't know. I think I just double entered the slide. Wow. Oh, uh, oh filtration. You know, people come by and say, hey, how do you keep your pond so clear? No, I don't. You're just lucky. I got these little filters. It's like, uh, this is not big enough for anything. Neither is that. Now that was a good filter, but uh, I had it on my first pond before I moved. I, uh, I lived in a very small house and I built this eight by eight pond and stuck fish outside and I jumped in and I met my wife and she thought I was kind of crazy until she got in and ever since then she's been, yeah, okay, you can have a pond. It was kind of cool to go in snorkeling and look at your fish. <laughs> Let's see, three things I didn't want to forget to mention, or, or not volume, I think I made that clear. Rectangular sheets don't conform well to a rectangular boxes, and something else. Let's see, it's either waterproofing, temperature, evaporation, wildlife books. Uh, okay, on the books, I've been really happy with all the new books. Anything written after about 2000, it's good, you know. Uh, the earlier ones, they're always telling you these weird things. Uh, we covered wildlife, evaporation. You'd think that during the summer you'd have more evaporation, but the key to evaporation really is the wind. Even on very cold days, a slow breeze right across the top of your pond will just suck water out of it. Um, the way to check whether or not you have an actual leak or if it's just evaporation is you stick a bucket full of water at the same level, you know, and you check it the next day. Either it's going to be the same as the outside pond, or it'll be different. And then you'll know if you have a leak. Gosh. Wish I could remember what I was going to say about temperature. Okay, as far as waterproofing, pool plaster. You know, pools hold water. Why not use pool plaster? Pool plaster, if it ever dries out, cracks. So don't use that. If you want to use something as a cementaceous sealant, there's a product called ThoroSeal by Sonneborn. And I'm not sure where you get it around here, but if, you, you know, if you're really anxious to build a cement pond, that's a really good uh, sealant. Uh, the thing is that it comes in a powder, and it takes a lot of effort to get it to, to go into solution, to mix up with water. I mean, well, of course, you know, it's supposed to be waterproof, so. Uh, there's a Henry's roof asphaltum. There's a lot, 708 or something like that. Yeah, don't ever use those things. Those are dirty. They're messy. They leave an oil slick on your water. That's what they used to use. It's awful. There's a new roofing product called Cool Coat, and I have no idea whether or not you can use it for a pond or not. I mean, I know they don't recommend it, but is that really going to stop me? <laughs> <laughs> There's a spray rubber, Rust-Oleum, you know, I, I think there's some other product as seen on TV that will waterproof things. I believe that would work, but when you spray something on, it's going to be a very thin layer. And even if it worked for a while, it'd be so easy to rub it off and it would fail. And uh, fiberglass, fiberglass resin, um, I love that stuff because then you can deal with, um, with spas. Uh, I don't know I, if I have a, oh, let's go back to some. This is a timer, you know, hose timer, and it used to be my practice to do massive water changes, but now this turns it off and I don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> ah, I have another 18 foot <laughs> diameter above ground pond that I used the, the uh, other half of the metal on. And the legs are sticking up because I had them, and I either had a pile of legs or I could just attach them. And I was looking at that thinking, wow, shoot, what should I do with that? Should I cut them down and make a rim on it? That would look nice. Or should I just leave them up and I could uh, put 
um, insect thing, a window screen all the way around and build a little aviary in there. I still haven't decided, so that's why they're there. Uh, that pond had, had multiple small holes. And uh, so what I did was I went to the 99 cent store and got the plastic drop cloths and just put them down and then threw dirt on top and then filled it with water. About two, two months later, I got this neat rows of plants growing up and I didn't know what they were and they were only, you know, six, eight inches high and then they got to be 12 inches and they turned out to be cattails. And I was like, where'd they come from? And my wife was telling me how my daughter loves to take the cattails when they're ready and then you swing them around and it looks like snow. Yeah, they ended up in the pond. <laughs> I'm not sure if I like it or not. You know, we'll see. One thing about them though, is I'm pretty sure they take a lot of water out of that pond and throw it up in the air. In fact, the only thing I, I know would do worse would be a willow tree. I mean, those things can suck upon dry. You let the, the root go in there. Um, but I have, I don't know if you can see these little uh, tanks here. They're small, uh, not little tanks, they're 55 gallon tanks, but they're cracked and I just drop them in there. And what those are for are for those fishes that I know I'm going to want to pull out of the pond because if I ever stick a fish into an 18 foot pond, it's not certain that it's ever coming out. You know, I, it's really hard to catch them. Uh, but uh, like uh, I put in uh, Bolivian rams to see how if they spawn outside, and no, they didn't for me. But at least I could catch them out. You know come September or uh, late October. I'm supposed to do it in September and I always think, yeah, September, this is, that's when I'm going to catch out all the fish and put them inside as soon as I clean out that tank. Uh, I've got the nice red lily, uh, water lily. Oh, I tried using this. This is the kitchen sink, you know. So yes, I have tried everything including the kitchen sink. It was just way, way too small. Like I said, man-made, you know, things that people use are meant to <laughs> minimize the amount of water used. Um, one of the things that popped up in my pond is uh, macroalgae. You know, when you set, first set up a pond outside, what you're going to find out is you first uh, you have clear water, then you're going to have a pea soup green unicellular floating algae, then you're going to have filamentous algae, and if you're lucky, I guess, you end up with this stuff, which is a, a macroalgae. It's a Nitella, either flexilis or gracilis. I don't know of any algae experts. I, I don't know, you know, hard to tell what species. But there is a related species that looks almost like this, called uh, Cara, or stonewort. And the reason it's called stonewort is because it actively takes up minerals from the water and puts it in the leaves. And man, if you ever swim over that stuff, it's scratchy. But I'm hoping that if I ever find that stuff, I'll, I'll throw it in there and see if it actually makes the water hardness uh, or alleviate some of the problems with water hardness. Because I have tested my water and gotten up uh, above a thousand parts per million. And that might not hurt the fish, but it can't be good for them. Uh, that's a Sioux water lily in the later stages. Uh, red Reuben sort, like I said, in the, in the pond by the side. Uh, yeah, that was my 18-footer uh, my when I first uh, started. I used the, uh, the big round things inside that pond. I got from uh, Target, they were, they were, where they were advertising trans lights. But they were plastic and I just fill them full of gravel and grow aquatic plants in them. I have um, two types of Sagittaria. Uh, corkscrew valisneria, well, four types of valisneria, the uh, uh, chain sword. Basically, you know, I'm willing to try throwing anything outside. Let's see, the fish outdoors all year round. I'm sorry, I was supposed to put these into the common names, but uh, uh, Lucini Good Eye of Florida Bluefin Killy, uh, Florida Flagfish. Uh, Red-tailed Gadeids, uh, Heterandria formosa is the least killifish, 
which is really weird since it's not a killifish, it's a live bear. Can it be albinubes? That's the white claws. I think there are some on the table over there. Um, paradise fish. There are um, a couple different kinds of paradise fish. I'm not sure if the black paradise are a different species or just a different subspecies, but I did spawn those outside. But for some reason, uh, bad things always happen to them. Bad luck. That was weird. Uh, raccoons would go in there. Okay, I saved two of them. I raised them up. They grew. They spawned. The, I had a spawn of black paradise. And uh, I can't remember what weird mishap. I think a tree fell down in there. It's it just weird. It's like, wow, this is the worst luck fish in the world. Um, I have two types of, no, three types of uh, cichlids outside. Uh, Gymnogeophagus meridionalis, Gymnogeophagus real catalan. The Gymnogeophagus comes from Uruguay. Uh, the third type is the other Uruguay cichlid. Oh, Australopithecus red sebo. And uh, the thing about those is I bought a small pair out of Ocean Aquarium in San Francisco and took them down and put them in my pond. They were like, uh, oh, I'd say a little bit more than two inches. I never saw them for about a year, year and a half. And then all of a sudden this big old thing swam around it's like, there's an eight inch fish in there. I don't, you know, where, where's an eight inch fish hiding? You know, but uh, I didn't see him much. And then I uh, went to Arizona. Uh, the Arizona Riverlands Keeper have a, a meeting every March. It's called the uh, Sake, S-A-K-E, where they, you know, have this uh, weekend where they do a, a day-long seminar and, and an auction. So I went over there, got some more of those uh, red sea bulls. So I, I had, uh, I think, six uh, three-inch fish, tossed them in the pond, said, look, I see these uh, red sea bull. And all of a sudden, these two big things come floating out of the water. And I was like, hey, or, like, okay. But they look kind of just brown. And for, I don't know, four or five months, I was looking at these brown fish thinking, I wonder why they call them red. Um, and then one day I was standing on the edge of the pond, and I was like, how come they're not all pretty like that one over there? And I was like, that one? Oh, yeah. So I walk over and I look in. Sure enough, she's sitting on top of a spawn. So that was kind of neat. It's like one of the coolest things is when you get uh, sick with the spawn. I mean, because they're immediately visible in a pond. First of all, they can't hide. They have to guard the babies, so they're always there, and they're always colored up. So that's really cool. Let's see, what else did I keep? I kept uh, goldfish, that's the crassus, rotus, and uh, rosy barbs. Oh, um, Odessa barbs will survive outside. Uh, it's kind of, I haven't found a, a way of telling which barbs are going to make and which not, uh, or not, but I'm pretty sure most of those two-spot barbs, like uh, the Tico, Tito and uh, the other two spot barb um, would survive, but most of the barbs require warmer water. Uh, Ciprinodon species, we know that pupfish will survive outside. Uh, the problem with, pup, problem with pupfish is not that it won't survive outside, the problem is their, their eggs survive almost everything. Um, when I found out that I wasn't supposed to have the pupfish I had, I netted them all out, gave them away, dried out the, the bathtub, sat there thinking, well, what should I do with it? Filled the uh, bathtub back up with water after two weeks. And I was thinking, well, you know, I got these swordtails. I'll just put these swordtails in there because I got them from the auction. They were really cheap. I couldn't pass them up. So, yeah. And I put the swordtails in, and these little fish started swimming around. It's like, wait a minute. These are not out of the bag. It's like, oh. You know, the pupfish eggs have hatched and swimming around in there. Um, fungulus chrysotis, it's a golden ear uh, fungulus. Um, it's a top min the fungulus are top minnows, they're native to uh, the Midwest and Southeast Florida. And I have one of my friends tells me that the chrysotis are beautiful fish, and I'll have to take his word for it. 
every time I look at them, I'm like, why did I have great fish in here? And I, I should have brought them up and then you guys could have them. <laughs> uh, uh, Orisius lactifes, uh, oh, that's the uh, rice fish, the madaka. They'll survive outside. As a matter of fact, in Japan, they survive the snow, you know, on top of those ponds. Uh, I also have daisies rice fish that don't survive, and um, I actually had them in the 18-foot pond before I put the cichlids in, and they did really well until September. And then, you know, luckily I had saved about 10 of them, because one day in September, before anything else had died, I looked down and I had, uh, I don't know, it, it, you know, I thought I only had a few uh, dozen in there, but when I was looking at the, the bottom of the pot, it was a pretty apparent I had over a thousand. I was like, where were they? Well, they're here now. Uh, you know, Chuck Rambo and somebody else have the Dead Fish Society, where in order to be a member, you have to, jo uh, you have, to have killed a, over a thousand fish. And I said, well, you mean all at once or one at a time? Because I've done both. <laughs> Well, if you keep a lot of fish, it's going to happen to you. Um, this is off fish varios, uh, the fish The Varyatus uh, gladius will survive, and they tend to be the hardiest. As a matter of fact, right now, I have um, red wag gladius outside. I had the adults outside, and I caught those. I had them in a 100-gallon tank. Oh, and that's a weird thing, because I put these six adult Red wag flat in a 100 gallon tank, and I was wondering if it was too small for them. And I laughed. It's like, 100 gallon tank? How come when it's outside, it seems like it's so small? But, uh, so I caught the adults out, but the babies, uh, some of the babies are still out there. They, you know, so maybe they'll survive the winter. Uh, Stop it. There's an Asian version, uh, or Asia Minor version of the pupfish, of the Cipriano pupfish, the Aphanius, Aphanius Mento. It's a very one, an easy killing fish to keep. It's, it's great. It probably would survive outdoors out here. Um, normally, well, they're very aggressive, and normally they're just this little gray, nasty fish that's banging on all your other fish. And then one day, the male will color up. And you'll be walking by, and from 15, 20 feet away, you'll go, what the heck's that? It'll be a black fish with sparkly, uh, bright dots on it. I mean, they're beautiful when they're colored up. But the rest of the time, they're just killing other fish. <laughs> okay, and we're going to call this the end. That's my daughter a couple years ago in that uh, liner pond. So, any questions? Black paradise is a different species. Excuse me? It is. The black paradise? It is a different species, yes. Yeah, you think it's con color? I don't I know. I mean, uh, everything I look at, I go, uh, that's just, you know how people are, how students are with their, oh, this is a different species now. Oh, no, they're all the same. It's like, ah, they're close enough where I'm not, I'm not positive that they're a different species. If you look, yeah. at, the, look at their tails, it's different. Um, were you using cattle panels on the tops of some of your ponds to keep predators out? I was using whatever I found in dumpsters. <coughs> you know, stores will throw out these these uh, uh, racks, yeah. and I was like, hey, these are great. You know, oh, okay, this will fit. That'll fit. Uh, I have tried using uh, carbonets, but you know, sometimes you have to buy them. He's got. Well, you guys are all probably all rich, so it doesn't matter. Oh, it's there. Yeah, I know. So. Yes? Are you using Hardy or Trump's water lilies? Hardy uh, water lilies. Uh, and then when you use the water lilies, do you find if you have like a lot of movement that they don't do as well as they do as if the water is still? Uh, I don't use anything to move water in my ponds because the, the, the ponds down below are just too far away. I'd have to run a uh, service about 100 feet. And I don't, 
I don't use the electricity next to my house because I don't want to pay for it. So in my ponds, the water tends to be, if not stagnant, relatively still. I did try using the pond pumps, the solar pond pumps from Harbor Freight, the smaller ones, and the problem is those were direct drive, and I mean, they were like $20, and they all failed because the seal failed, you know, and, and they get rusted. As far as the water lilies go, um, I don't, I don't think water lilies have a problem, particularly with flow, as long as you're not uh, putting them directly beneath the flow from a filter. Um, as a matter of fact, the best filter in the world for outside is about 10 feet of uh, water hyacinth. If you can get any kind of restricted stream and move the water through water hyacinth roots, man, th those things suck up nutrients. Like, I mean, they will clear a, uh, a pond. As a matter of fact, there's a... Uh, um, so, so literally using it as filtration. Right. Right. Uh, somebody else recommends using bare root irises because they do well bare root. Um, as far as water lilies go, I think that most people spend way too much time and energy worrying about the water lilies. Hardy water lilies will survive. Tropical water lilies need warmth. As far as I can tell, no water lily needs uh, particularly special care. Um, we have a friend down in Escondido area, and he's got these huge greenhouses where he does keep tropical lilies. And uh, they're gorgeous, but, you know, um, you have to keep the temperature in the high 70s at least. Yeah. And, right, right. Can I ask one more question? Sure. I have an old fiberglass freeform pond. And I had asked Tony about this years ago, I think. Anyway, this this fiberglass pond sheds. I mean, yes. Literally. Yes. And it itches. It's, oh, oh God. Yeah. yeah. The so, thing is. So what would the best? Thing I'll just use the resin. You can go in and buy resin either in. Uh, well, if you need a lot, you can buy a gallon or a quart. And it's a two-part thing. It, uh, uh, the problem with it is anything you use to mix it, you're going to throw. It has to be disposable. Um, so I use a coffee can, and all you have to do is use the resin according to directions, and it's something like 17 drops per ounce, or you know, so if you can measure it out, like. Uh, so an how ounce would you bit. clean if you had a pond? If you had an uh -huh. active pond and you stripped it all out, uh -huh. how would you clean that fiberglass that exists? You know, that free right. form hole. How would you clean that? in order to re it with How would I do it, or how would I recommend doing it? <laughs> how would you recommend doing it? Okay, well, you know, the thing is that the, the as long as you don't have a lot of things on there, you, hmm, because I don't want to, I don't want to kill you. Um, personally, what I, what I would think about doing is putting a respirator on, and just lightly sanding it. I mean, first you 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 know spray it out and get all the uh, clean it. That's yeah, all, all the all, you know, and just use a scrub brush or something. But Anything sand. loose will come off. If you are worried at all, just use a light sandpaper. You know, use hundred grit. It doesn't really matter. All you want to do is roughen it up because the the resin after you mix it up, you know, and it's liquid. You just paint it on in a nice thick layer. And it'll form a shell, continuous shell, all the way through. It's not, um, it's not easy simply because the stuff is sticky, it's smelly, but it's great stuff, and it's very simple to do. You know, um, and if you even ha if you had a hole in there uh, that you thought you know was weak, you could just get a little bit of fiberglass uh, or nylon. Uh, just as a reinforcing mesh, because the uh, the uh, solution of resin is going to be the the membrane that holds the water in, and that just has to be continuous. You know, and once you coat it, it'll be slick and smooth, and you won't have that problem with the uh, 
with the fiber, uh, the, the glass from the fiber, the fibers in the glass getting out. How long does it take for fiberglass to shed like that? Uh, depends on depends on uh, the situation. The thing is that you know um, the enemy of, of plastics and, and things like PVC, uh, sunlight, UV, heat, ozone. Um, I was up in Monterey, Mexico, which is in a high valley, and I, our friend showed me this inch and a half PVC pipe that he said was. Uh, a little bit more than a year old, and it had been sitting outside. It was orange, and it was so brittle, you could just grab it and crumble it. And so, what they, re well, it's not even, uh, building codes now say that any exposed PVC has to be painted. I used to think swimming pool plumbers did that to be neat or, you know, snazzy. No, it's code. You have to paint PVC. The fiberglass, you know, the resin itself, yeah, that will break down with sunlight, with heat, with other things. So it's hard to say how long it will be, but it should be quite a while. I, I, I doubt that it would be less than five or ten years. You know, um, so, you know, and it's a fairly inexpensive way to, to cure that problem. Yeah? Thank you. What we're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a painter on the side. Uh -huh. One of my jobs, I'm a painter, so I've been doing some, I did some water tower work at Heavily Valley. And we used a product called Thermocoat to make sure that our water towers wouldn't freeze up there at elevation at 9,100 feet. <laughs> it's called Thermocoat. It's very expensive. We're talking about economical ways to do things. Yeah. It's an epoxy base. I'm sorry. And it's got a catalyst that will last forever. Uh huh. <laughs> and I know it's spinning, but. Oh. How, how much per get? I mean, you like buy the five gallon, gallon tub and it's like just mix it up. Gallons. Yeah. Yeah, there, 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 it, there are a few other things, chemicals that might be suitable. But all those chemicals will tell you are not recommended for use in ponds because they don't want the liability. You know, but it's like, well, it holds water. I don't care. My fish will be fine. This is the drinking water system. Yeah, that's, that's really, you know, one of the, my pet peeves is I go to the 99 cent store for my silicone rubber because it's a silicone and I'm going to use it. But, you know, when you go into Home Depot and you see that big rack of silicone rubber and it all says 100% silicone and it all has different things in it, I thought, how could that be 100% silicone if I got poison here, I got this stuff toxic here, I got paintable, it's like, if it's 100% silicone rubber, shouldn't it be safe for my fish? You know, I have, ah. Those people at Home Depot don't like me. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not your fault, but it says 100%. What do you think 100% means? <laughs> yeah, well, not always, but you know. <laughs> but uh, the, the thing is, you can do a lot of things if you're... Oh, temperature. The reason I do above ground ponds is because I know I'm going to be moving them around. I mean, after you heard this talk, you know I'm, I'm not the most stable person. So, um, the difference between digging a pond out and having an above-ground pond, mostly is that the in-ground ponds will be more stable in temperature. They'll warm up more slowly, and they probably won't get, ever get as warm, and they'll cool down more slowly. But the ones above ground, they'll react to the ambient temperature much more quickly. And, uh, you know, I've had my 18-foot uh, ponds get into the low 90s. Not, they don't stay there very long, but they do get warm. I've never had a fish die from heat. Um, first time for everything, though. One of these days I'll put some cold water fish in there. I'm like, hey. So, yeah. I was just going to ask, do you ever put, like, have you ever tried to put, like, the smaller buckets or tanks to put, like, a plastic netting they do, like, with the with frost gums and the plants to try to keep it warm? Oh, yeah, um, I've tried, uh, uh, quite a few experiments to try to keep one section warm. You know, I don't want to keep the whole pond warm. I just, 
I just want someplace warm where the fish can go or where the plants will survive. I have yet to find anything that worked. You know, and uh, I would have actually showed you my experiments, but they just look like garbage. Well, the rest of it looks like garbage too, but you know. Yes? Um, I have the water fast and I'm trying to keep alive. I'm up in the foothills. We got down to 10 degrees air temperature. I can't believe it's still alive. I put them in my greenhouse. It's unheated. Uh -huh. But they're in a, a tub and well, then I covered them with glass. Yeah. Yeah, you can talk and they're to Mark not looking about that. Good, he does that too. But they're still alive. Yeah. You, as long as you. Uh, my friend Dave Kurtwright says that the secret to keeping them alive over the winter is to allow them to get their roots into mud. Because he feels that, you know, um, well, he does pond maintenance, and he says, you ever walk around in a pond in winter? I said, no. And he said, well, you can tell when you're on composting mud because it's warm. And he said, that's the secret. And I said, well, yeah, one of these days I'll compost a, a bucket of something in my pond, but until then I'll just get my water hyacinths from Mark Allen, who has a greenhouse. He raises his water um, during the winter. He puts them, uh, brings them inside. The one problem that he has with them is that if he, when he sells them to the nursery and people are putting them outside right away, I think they said they get sunburned. So you have to kind of gradually bring them out. That, but that's uh, you know small, and they reproduce so rapidly. It's it's kind of neat. Yeah. Have you ever used an uh, old uh, hot tub? For hot tub? <laughs> um. I spent all, uh, all night shoving more pictures in, and I was like, ah, I wish I could have gotten my hot tub. I, yes, I, I have a round spot um, that showed up in one of the uh, supermarket uh, uh, parking lots. Somebody dumped it there. So I did my civic duty, and I cleaned up. I grabbed it. Um, I used uh, the uh, fiberglass mesh, you know, and uh, resin and sealed up most of the jet holes. I used uh, some pieces of plastic and silicone, sealed up the rest. I, the, um, the intake, the uh, leaf trap, you know, that square hole, I put a pane of glass in there, and I kind of like it. It didn't work out quite right, though. I have a desa bar, and I have crayfish in there. And I, uh, I don't know. I, I, everything's living, but they're not thriving. And I don't know... I don't know if it's uh, something residual or if it's just I don't have the right situation for them. Um, I was on Craigslist and there was a guy saying he was giving away a eight person hot tub, you know, and I said, call him and said, I don't want it, but if you can't get rid of it after five days, give me a call. And after five days I got a call. It's still sitting in my backyard and my wife asked, Hey, you know how many holes are in that? 29. Um, and someday, I'll have enough time to go ahead and seal up all those holes. But my, my idea was, there's this big rectangular area. I could cut that out and put a pane of glass in there if I have the right size broken tank around. And I will have, sooner or later. Uh, so, it, you know, it's like, ah, okay, maybe when summer comes, I'll, I'll have enough time in the daylight to get all this stuff done. They work, they're probably not uh, the best solution, but hey, if it's free, I'm taking it. Incidentally, not too long ago, my wife went to a, a talk on, a seminar talk on bats, and she brought home a brochure, and the brochure said, in order to attract bats, add a pond to your backyard. And I said, okay, honey, I don't know where I'll put it, but if you want, I'll put a pond in our backyard, I'll add one. And she just looked at me. <laughs> it's like, wow, we should be overrun with bats. Um, the thing is that, uh, you know, um, it's just so much fun. You, you can go out there and you, 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 can, you know, especially if you think, well, you know, up in Minnesota, they got people who raise koi, and they have to bring in these three-foot fish in for the winter. Well, heck, if they're willing to do that with three-foot fish, I'm willing to do it with a three-inch fish if I can catch them. Uh, and that, that tends to be the main problem. It's like when the fish go out there, 
it's really tough to get them back out when you want them. You know, like if I'm coming to a meeting and I said, hey, I'd like to take some of these to the meeting. But, yeah, but I don't, I don't have a day to do it. There are minnow traps. If you look on, on uh, YouTube or you know, you, you'll see these two liter bottles. It, you know, make a minnow trap out of two liter bottles. As a matter of fact, I got one in my truck. I meant to bring it in. All you need is two two liter bottles and some window screen, and you can make a minnow trap. And if you've got something small like sore tails or platies, um, guppies, whatever, they work great. Or even the baby cichlids. Actually, they almost work too well because if you if you bait them with fish food, sink them in, and you go away, within an hour there'll be a lot of fish in there. If you too long, there'll be so many fish in there they'll start dying. It's just amazing because you know at first you get a couple fish in there eating, and when they get panicked and they say, "Hey, how do I get out of here?" The other fish go, "What's going on?" And they go in there. And the more panicked these little fish are, the more go in. And I, I just don't, you know, it's like, uh, okay. But the, it is the one great way of getting small fish. You know, like uh, sometimes uh, for our uh, San Diego Tropical Fish Auction, I'll just drop one in for you know, half an hour and whatever I get goes to the auction. Um, but really, if you can think ahead and think about how you're going to get the fish out. Oh, incidentally, you didn't see, but I've got uh, a 100 gallon, uh, 125, uh, 260 gallons that all have cracked bottoms. And you, even if you repair them, you can't trust them. So I just drop them in the pond, and then I stick the fish I know I'm going to want to get out in there. On these yeah. fish you're getting out, do you, and you're <coughs> taking right to your auction, do you worry about Parasites, flukes, or something that they picked up in the pond? Do I worry about it? <laughs> People who buy them from me probably should, but no. <laughs> uh, or, or do uh, I they don't up, introduce Are they them. pretty healthy? Yes, they're most, most of the time they're healthier. Than, one of the things that uh, inspired me to put fish outside is when I was in college, my roommate had a 55 gallon tank in our living room window with African cichlids. They could see the sun, they got a lot of direct sunlight, and it, but not, um, it didn't overheat. But the color was so intense. When you put stuff outside, the, the colors get so much better. I, and I'm not sure if it's just because of the sunlight or because of the food. Incidentally, have you ever been standing outside, you know, short sleeves, and something lands on you? It's like, hey, what are you doing? That's the stuff the fish eat. I mean, I don't... I only feed my fish for fun. I don't feed them because I have to, because they'll do fine without me feeding them. But if I throw food in, at least I get to see them come up. But, you know, and the neat thing was when I had half beaks in there, because they would be eating all this microscopic stuff, uh, little flying stuff, that, ow, I don't know, I took it as a personal affront, but they kept on landing on me. You know, little aphids and things. So it was, it was really, when you watch half beaks swimming around on the surface, I, oh, I should stick hatchet fish. That'd be cool too. You know. Oh, and you know hatchet fish fly, right? They flap. They actually. You're not going to see that in the tank. You might be able to see it in a pond. I don't know how big the pond would have to be. Probably, you know, 10, 12 feet. But maybe one of these days I'll do it. You know. Back to your slides. One of the first slides that you had. You had like these, like skunk and raccoon and right. all. Right. But at the end, you had lizard and snakes. Well, I'm not worried about the snakes, but as I think you meant predators, lizards and toads and frogs. Uh -huh. And it would be like, so you're saying that lizards and toads and frogs are predators? I mean, no, 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 no. It was just visitors. Not, not necessarily predators, although garden snakes are great predators in, in fish ponds. But um, I mean, I have, a, I have endeavored to get... And a full frog will empty your pond. Well, not full frogs, but I've endeavored to get like... The Pacific know, tree frogs, the little guys? I, 
whatever tadpoles turn into and not gold frogs. They're either usually wood frogs or leopard frogs. I mean, and, and there's a whole range of frogs that go down the Mississippi no, that I have fun. Like Pickerel frogs? Tree frogs. Oh. Wood, the, wood frog. Well, how big are, are, are these? Forest this frogs. side or this side? <laughs> this side. No, small little. Oh, she's yeah. talking about our local tree frog or chorus right. frog. Right, and, and the tree yeah. frogs are great. I mean, I like them, but in Mira Mesa, when it rains, there are vernal pools, and one of the things we find is fairy shrimp and some Daphne and Bosmia, uh, and then the tree frogs come and they lay their eggs. And my, my daughter and I love to go up there and collect them. The people who live there hate it because, I don't know if you, you know, there have been lawsuits about people building ponds and having tree frogs come in next door. A tree frog can be heard a mile away. Those little tiny things are loud. And I don't mind. You know, I, I like the sound of it, but I don't have to live there either. So, um... If you want to have tree frogs, uh, sooner or later, I think you will. I, as a matter of fact, I'm surprised I don't. I can hear them. I don't understand, you know, why they haven't shown up yet. Uh, I'm not so surprised about the toads because I do live in a suburban area where they're wiping out most of the habitat for, uh, for the toads. So there used to be toads around, but they're not anymore. Um, but not everything, you know, not everything's a predator or on. But you're going to see. But you didn't perceive it as a predator when no. you had it up. No. All right. No. All right. Thanks for a great <laughs> talk. Thank you.